and welcome to yet another NPTEL session of this course Introduction to World Literature. And today we are discussing the text Othello by William Shakespeare. William Shakespeare is of course a man who needs no introduction. He is considered as the greatest playwright who lived during the Elizabethan times and he is also seen as the best known name and the best known artist from England. He lived from 1564 till 1616. Those of you are familiar with Shakespeare's biography would also know that these dates are uh, based on certain uh, conjectures which are part of the documents available. There is no actual birth record or a death record. And Shakespeare earned his fame and his reputation as a poet, a sonneteer, actor and an entrepreneur. He wrote with an eye on the market. He was not one of those conventional writers who lived in staged plays during those times. He staged his plays directly even before he had the time to publish anything by himself. And also uh, it said that he arrived in London from Stratford upon Avon totally friendless and he started his career in a very low profile and then he went on to become the best known face in London. How he went back to Stratford upon Avon to buy the second largest property. He also became a shareholder in some of the important playhouses of those times. So that was a kind of steady growth that he had as a dramatist and as an entrepreneur and as an artist who had an eye on the market. So uh, Shakespeare's uh, literary reputation as a dramatic genius was cemented only in the 19th century. He was of course seen as a successful artist, a successful dramatist, but in the 19th century we also find him getting elevated to the status of a literary genius. We also find a plethora of artists uh, of critical works emerging since the 19th century on Shakespeare. So today we are looking at one of his greatest tragedies, Othello. This is presumably written in 1603. This is one of, uh, this belongs to his later phase when he was writing during the time of uh, King James the first. And this, uh, the, the, the full title goes like this, Othello, the tragedy of Othello, the Moor of Venice. There are two central characters in this play, Othello and Iago, and there are a few other important characters as well, including uh, Desdemona, Emilia, Cassio, Brabantio. Uh, they all play a significant role, but nevertheless, it's possible to say that this play belongs to Othello and Iago, and some even go to the extent of saying that it belongs to Iago, who is the villain of this piece. And uh, this play, Othello, it has continued to be a huge success whenever it was staged, and there is over a dozen film adaptations. And this has also become an inspiration for a number of other kinds of works which emerged in the earlier and in the present times. It's often said that Shakespeare's supreme dramatic genius is seen in his tragedies and Othello is one such work which manifests his supreme genius, his uh, 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 supreme craft and his dramatic artistry in, in uh, more or less perfect ways. So the play Othello, uh, it shares with the other important tragedies such as King Lear, Macbeth and Hamlet a fascination with evil. All these four tragedies are considered as the most important ones and the most intense works of uh, uh, Shakespeare. And uh, if you read up about the critical tradition available on uh, Shakespeare and the scholarship on Shakespeare, you'll also notice a number of works on these four tragedies. And in Othello, we find uh, that a number of people have studied the devastating effects of jealousy and uh, the vengeful emotions. And Shakespeare only had a passing interest in the political strife. And uh, we find that Shakespeare's Roman tragedies are mostly devoted to that. Otherwise, the, in, in the action of Othello, we find the concentration is overwhelmingly on the emotion of jealousy. And we find Shakespeare taking this emotion to different levels, playing with it, and even using that as a character itself to shape, redefine, and even change different characters. On the protagonist Othello, the Moor, there's no consensus on Othello's ethnic origin. The term Moor has obviously been used to describe Othello. And it's said that uh, the Renaissance representations of the Moor were vague, varied, inconsistent, and even contradictory. So uh, it's perhaps safe to say that Moor is a term used to refer to dark skinned people in general. And it's obviously a racist uh, derogatory term. And this has also been used interchangeably with terms such as African, Somali, Ethiopian, Negro, Arab, Berber, or even uh, Indian. 
to suggest that these are people from faraway lands who are predominantly non-European in some way or the other. And these references to the non-white in various ways have drawn attention from various critical circles and uh, as mentioned it's also been seen as very racist and derogatory but the focus of this play is mostly on how jealousy as an emotion can be seen as a universal emotion and that there is hardly any difference in the basis of race or gender that we find while the emotion of jealousy is at work. So it's interesting to notice how the play looks at jealousy and how the center of uh, interest always returns to the destruction of a love through jealousy. The protagonist here is not a king or a prince but he is a general, an army general and he's also recently married and in this play, unlike some of the other plays by Shakespeare, there are no supernatural visitations. There's no comic sweep or shaking of social order. We only have as a protagonist a fair-minded Duke of Venice in control. So when the play begins, things are completely under control and we even get this impression that this is mainly a political story, the story of a political strife with a love story in the background. But as the play progresses, we get to know that it is totally otherwise. The political actions, it automatically they go to the background and we realize that it is mostly about this man, Othello, and he, how he is swayed, how his emotions are being swayed by these cunning interventions by Iago, who once was his trusted confidante, but from the beginning of the play, we also get to know that Iago is not what he is. And in this play, perhaps to invoke the kind of racist, derogatory attitude that the white characters had towards the Moor, we find a lot of images being invoked from the natural world or from the animal world, like goats, monkeys, baboons, barberry horse, green-eyed monster, and sometimes uh, terms such as green-eyed monster. It is also used to talk about abstract emotions, such as abstract emotions such as jealousy. And there is a very predominant use of the racially pejorative image of blackness, uh, especially when the discussions are about the Moor, thick lips, sooty bosom. So these are the ways in which Shakespeare is also trying to tell us about the dominant attitudes of the playgoers of those times, of the audience of those times towards the non-white. You also need to keep in mind that this was the time when England was going really successful in their overseas expeditions. The race for the colonies had already begun and England, we realized that within a few decades, they also become the number one, they become the superpowers in terms of uh, the racial power equation. So coming back to the play, during the Elizabethan times, the term more did not really distinguish between Arabian and African people. It was used as a general term to refer to any dark-skinned person. So here we do not find Shakespeare also taking any particular care or any pain to show us whether the Moor Othello was Arabian or African or something else. So he leaves it at that and perhaps leaves it very open for the audience's imagination. And it's also important to notice that during the Elizabethan period, especially for the Elizabethan audience, it really did not matter from there, from where the Moor came, as long as his blackness, his non-whiteness was emphasized to create a contrast. Othello and Desdemona are the pair, are the couple who are in love and at the outset of the play we get to know that they decide to elope and get married and this is also happening at a very significant uh, juncture in in Othello's own career and Desdemona has done this pretty much against the will of her father who also had favored Othello as a general who had favored Othello as an adventurer but not as a suitor for his daughter so Othello and Desdemona are forced to prove their love in the face of these prejudices against miscegenation. And this also becomes one of the subplots in this play, one of the subtexts in this play, which becomes very, very significant in reading the play against the colonial rhetoric, which was getting predominant from the Elizabethan times onwards. The relationship between a white woman and a non-white or a black person was seen as something unnatural and to make things worse Othello is being portrayed as being black as well as older than Desdemona 
and uh, in, in fact, uh, as the play progresses, we realize that Othello himself, of course, at the instigation of Iago, he himself begins to think of this and he is undone by his own lack of self-esteem. And this lack of self-esteem, this lack of uh, confidence in his own looks, in his own personality, in his own compatibility as far as uh, his union with Desdemona is concerned, we find that that becomes a useful breeding ground for Iago's plotting. So the tragic flaw in Othello, the protagonist, the Hamashia in Othello is, uh, is the insufficient regard for himself. He begins to see himself through the eyes of Venice, through the eyes of Brabantio, and finally through the eyes, through the emergent eyes of uh, uh, Desdemona herself. And we find that Iago finds it very, very easy to manipulate uh, Othello. He doesn't even have to try too hard. And Othello's intense love for Desdemona, in fact, prepares the way for his tragedy. And towards the end, uh, ironically, Othello himself realizes that, that he is someone who loved wisely but not too well. And Iago is one of the most fascinating characters of Shakespeare. He's considered as one of the finest villains sketched in literary, <coughs> in literary canvas. And Iago belongs to a group of villains in Shakespeare who, while motivated in human terms, they also take delight in evil for its own sake. So he is this personified evil derived from the vice of the morality play, morality play being one of the earlier kinds of play before the Elizabethan stage took over. And these villains like Iago, they take the audience into their confidence, they boast in soliloquy about their cleverness and they exult in the triumph of evil. We find Iago doing precisely that throughout the play. While one is appalled at this capacity of evil that Iago has, one is also awestruck by his ability, by his smooth uh, maneuvering through these different other humans. And uh, the, uh, in, in, in the morality play also, we find that this character personifying vice or evil, they are also superb actors deceiving every other character until late in the action. So there is, uh, there is this action happening at two levels. On the one hand, they are good actors on stage. On the other hand, they are also deceiving the other characters. And what makes it all the more thrilling an experience for the audience is that this is not covered before the audience. The audience can see through the villainy of these characters, but the other characters cannot. This increases the tension level uh, while the audience are watching the play. And in Othello, we notice that Iago has more lines than Othello. And he's considered as one of uh, Shakespeare's most sinister villains. And ironically, throughout the play, Othello trusts him, blindly trusts him. Othello trusts Iago more than his friend Cassio, more than his beloved uh, Desdemona, more than anyone else. And we find, we find Othello becoming a very weak man, someone without rationale, someone without common sense when he is with Iago. And Iago is often referred to as honest Iago. And we begin to see the irony in this. The audience begin to see the irony in this. But thanks to the supreme uh, craft uh, in this play, we find that the other characters are not able to see through this irony. And uh, this also reminds us of uh, the way in which Shakespeare again uses such techniques in his uh, uh, play, in his Roman tragedy, Julius Caesar, where uh, while Mark Antony is making this famous speech. He continuously refers to Brutus as the honorable man. Brutus is an honorable man. He's drawing our attention to the act of deception that he uh, committed, but he's also referring to uh, Brutus as an honorable man. So the irony makes his villainy seem all the more unacceptable. Iago betrays the trust that Othello has on him and that's uh, also part of the way in which the plot unfolds. Shakespeare's characters were not always well formed and well rounded but in this uh, play we find that he has given perhaps more care in the way in which uh, Iago's character has been shaped. And Iago is someone who takes pleasure in his sport and the way he goes about his acts of villainy, his acts of deception, the way he goes about manipulating various other people, he seems to totally enjoy it. And this, that is his pastime, that is his sport and he is really good at it, we also uh, noticed. And Iago is someone uh, who is in the army and he hates being outranked, we get to know that in the beginning of the play. He 
has been outranked and Cashew has taken his place and this was perhaps a position that he had been waiting for and from that moment he has identified some significant motive but we also get to know throughout the play as it progresses that it was not really that motive alone it was not just uh, because he uh, felt this spite uh, because he was outranked by uh, Shik, uh, he was outranked by Cashew and uh, what uh, emerges as being very ironical and significant is that hatred precedes any other motive in Iago. In this soliloquy way he is trying to reason out his hatred. We also find him looking for various reasons. He even goes to the extent of assuming that perhaps his own wife had cheated him with the moor. So there is a way in which he goes looking for reasons even when there is none because hatred seems to be the only motive. And uh, in this play, uh, we notice that the way Shakespeare has presented these characters, the Shakespeare has drawn out these characters, every character seems to have a flaw except Desdemona. Desdemona is presented as someone who is flawless, who is perfect and who certainly did not receive the kind of ending that she does in this play. But of course there are some critics who also feel that Desdemona's character is not really well rounded and uh, Shakespeare has not given much care in shaping her character and she also speaks very less throughout the play. We get to know very little about the real Desdemona. Uh, Cassio who comes across as the other fine soul in this uh, play, he is also shown as being too fond of wine and women. So there is a way in which uh, Shakespeare rightfully gives a flaw to each of these characters so that the tragedy makes complete sense. And here we also need to remember that Shakespeare is someone who moved away from the classical tenets. He did not really subscribe to the classical notions of uh, a play and uh, he uh, experimented widely in the Elizabethan stage but nevertheless there are certain uh, concepts that he also borrows and uses freely in his idea of this tragedy, especially in the case of the tragic flaw, the Hamashia and uh, the, the, the conception of the tragic hero. So those are some of the things that we, we find him being in alignment with the classical uh, masters. And he is also who, someone who radically changed the stage and he also tried to introduce a lot of innovations which then became more or less uh, standardized in the Elizabethan and uh, English stage. Talking about Iago, uh, Coleridge once remarked that he has motiveless malignity. Uh, this is a phrase which has been continually used to refer to the motiveless you know, vicious acts performed by Iago throughout the play. And uh, some of the motives when we go through this play we realize that it could be the failure to get promoted because, because Cashew had already taken his position. It could be racism because he keeps making derogatory remarks about the Mo. It could be jealousy and it could be Othello's rumored infidelity with Emilia. And this is very interesting because Iago does not really seem to mind the infidelity because he is not someone who is really attached to his wife either. If this can serve as a reason to continue with his uh, uh, maligning ways then why not and this seems to be the spirit with which Iago continues to work and he also has this immense feeling of security but he is also frighteningly formidably confident and he is the only character who remains consistent throughout. We do not find him undergoing any change even after uh, being discovered even after his villainy being discovered towards the end we find him retaining his composure and remaining the same vicious villainous Iago that he was from the beginning. There is no reason for us to suspect that there perhaps was a past and there was a moment after which he became like this because he seems to totally enjoy his sport as many critics have put it. He seems to be totally in control of the uh, manipulations that he is doing and he does not feel even for a moment guilty about it. Make no mistake he does not try to amend his ways in any way and uh, even after Rodrigo uh, dies quite uh, accidentally we find that this man is left with no remorse and he is he can stoop to any level, he can take any kind of criticism and he knows how to change his behavior in front of each one and he is also very very smart because he knows the weaknesses of each person. He knows how insecure 
the Moor feels in front of his wife and, uh, 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 and, and how fortunate he thinks that Desdemona chose him over the others. Iago knows too well what Cashew's weaknesses are and Iago knows very well how to uh, make a fool out of uh, Rodrigo and he knows what language to use in each occasion and he also shifts between these registers. He can use extremely filthy language. He can use uh, language with a lot of sexual connotations. He can also use the profound intense language that he often uses with uh, Othello. The storyline can be seen as uh, immediate and direct. It's very, very sensational too. And there's a small cast of characters, but they are very intense. Each act is very, very dramatic as well. There are five acts in this play. And uh, in the following session, we shall take a look at some of the significant scenes in these different acts. Here uh, in this uh, session, we do not uh, propose to present you with the range of, in fact, the amazing range of critical traditions within which this play has been uh, located, the different readings and the different uh, analytical works available on Othello, but uh, we rather would prefer to present before you a close reading of some of the important scenes in these five acts. So I hope before that you will be able to take a look at the play itself and also become a little familiar with the kind of writing and the kind of style that uh, Shakespeare uses in Othello. So in the following session uh, where we take a closer look at some of the scenes across these five acts, it, uh, the reading would begin to make more sense for you. I thank you for listening and I look forward to seeing you in the next session where we do a close reading of the important scenes across five acts. Thank you.